Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and you've been waiting for this one, I'm sure, so let's get to it. Today, I will give you my review of the Gishelli Labs JNOG2 Socketed Digital to Analog Converter, or in other words, the Gishelli J2S. This is a, a balanced DAC that has a starting price of 260 US dollars and then goes up from there with various options and I will discuss that pricing in further detail here a little bit later in the review. This unit I bought with channel money, which is a, a fun thing that I get to say uh, anymore. Gishelli did not know that I was going to do that. I just bought it first and then I made contact with them and uh, asked them if they would send me some additional op amps so that I could talk about op amp rolling, which is one of the points of the J2 socketed version, and they happily said yes. So, uh, Gino and Sherry Gishelli were an absolute pleasure to work with. I had some email correspondence with them to talk about some technical issues, and I also had a video chat with them during the co course of this review to talk in further detail about some technical things, but to their credit, they had never once tried to uh, influence my opinion about the sound of this piece in any way. They were an absolute joy to work with, and other than being very helpful, were hands-off when it came to uh, when it turned towards review things, anything like that. So all of the thoughts and opinions you are about to hear are mine and mine alone. So we will go ahead and do shameless self-promotion and then we will come back on the other side and talk more about the Gishelli J2S. Here we go. Hi, I'm Wave Theory's Human Companion and he wants you to know that your support of this YouTube channel helps keep the reviews coming. If you enjoy Wave Theory's honest, thorough style, then make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and check out the links in the description below to sign up for the Patreon or send him a tip through PayPal. All right, enjoy the musings. Back in April of 2023, and it is early August of 2023 when I finally get around to filming the full review, I did a first impressions of the J2S, and the Gishellis were very kind and gave me the opportunity to reveal to the world their new wooden case design. So I will put a link to that first impressions video and the wooden case reveal down in the description below. I should also mention that uh, since I have been talking with the Gishellis, they... Um, uh, told me that they have an affiliate link program. So I figured uh, I might sell a few of these by talking about it and uh, might as well make some money back um, after sinking some money into this one. So if you wanna help out with that, if you are interested in buying the J2S and you like what I have to say about it and you would like to support the channel, please consider using that uh, affiliate link in the description below for this product or any Gishelli product. And I will get a few bucks back. All right, so, uh, Heads up here on this review early on, it is going to be a long one again because there is a lot to talk about, okay? We need to talk about the pricing because there are uh, lots of options and customizability that come with the J2S. How does that affect pricing? We're gonna talk about that. The whole point of having the J2 socketed version is so that you, the end user, can easily swap op amps. So what's going on there is that the output stages on this DAC, okay? So one op amp on each of the XLR outputs and one output for both of the single end, or one op amp for both of the single ended outputs on there. You can change the op amps on the output stages, okay? Um, through sockets in there and influence the sound. This unit that I bought uses the Sparkos 3602 uh, op amps, but the Gishelli's also very, very kindly sent me the stock TIOP1656 op amps, which I rolled in there. And they also initially sent me the TIOP1612 uh, op amps. And I had some issues with those, which I need to talk about. Um, but that also is an opportunity to talk about Gishelli's excellent customer service. So we're going to get to op amp rolling on, uh, in this video as well, as well as a how to. I'm actually going to show myself like opening up this unit and swapping out some op amps in case that you uh, are a little bit nervous about what that might look like. It's actually very simple. I will uh, let you watch me doing it so you can make a, a decision as to whether or not that's an avenue you wish to pursue. Okay, 
Other things that we need to talk about then are like using an aftermarket linear power supply with this thing, which I have one right here. So how does that affect the sound and what risks are there in doing that and so forth? We're going to talk about that. I'm also going to do a fairly detailed comparison with the Shit Bifrost 2 slash 6.4 in, in this review as well. And then as far as comparing with other DACs up in that um, price range up there, uh, I will have a whole separate video, hopefully coming in the near future, where I kind of sum up and give an overall uh, summary, hopefully, of a good number of the DACs in the mid five price category. So the Gishelli will be in there, the Bifrost 2 slash 6.4, the Denifrips Aries 12th anniversary edition, Socrus DAC 1421, uh, a couple of SMLs, SMSLs, a couple of toppings on it. They, those will be in there too soon. So stay tuned for all of that. All right. So I will timestamp all of this out so that you can jump around and get to the parts of the video that are of most use to you. So uh, look for that uh, as well, navigate as you need to. And I will say sonically, this DAC is uh, the next uh, unit in Gishelli's growing legacy here of just making excellent bang for the buck products, right? This unit here with the stock op amps is probably either right at or at least among the very best uh, of the under $300 balanced DACs that you can get out there. It, if it's not the best, again, it is right there with the best. So it's a really solid option there. I'm going to explain why through the course of this video. Then if you put the Sparkos 3602 op amps in this thing, um, it can actually become a really stunningly good value and that uh, rockets its performance, catapults it right up to the tier as a, so with DAX that I just mentioned. Like it is right there trading blows with the shit Bifrost 2 slash, slash 64, the Socrus DAC 1321, and the Denifrips Aries 12th Anniversary Edition. Like those three with this one kind of separate themselves, I think, from a lot of the other DAC competition in that price range. I'm going to explain why when we get to uh, that part of the review view as well. So get comfy, get yourself a, a beverage of choice here and um, yeah, sit back, relax. We got a lot of ground to cover. So let's get to it. All right. First thing that we should talk about is the pricing. So the basic cheapest option, just simply get this out the door, is the $260 version which has the DAC board. And I should say that the J2S here is built around an AK4493 DAC chip, right? So um, you get that DAC chip on all of these. So you get the board built around that chip and no USB module and a um, you get four total SPDIF inputs, two each of coax, um, RCA input and to each of Toslink fiber optic input on this thing. And then of course you get the balanced XLR output and the RCA single ended output. And the basic stock version comes with those TI OP 1656 uh, op amps. Okay, that's also in an aluminum case where you have choice of color for that and the acrylic face plates, face and back plates. Okay, on there, but those options are 260 US dollars. If you want the Amonero USB module, which is right here, not over here, it's right here, that's gonna be an added $50. So with that, that takes you to just over 300, so $310 there with a USB input. Now, if you wanna keep um, increasing in the quality and also increasing price, the Sparkos 3602 op amps are $79 a piece. If you want to put them on the balanced output stage, you're going to need to buy two of them, which is an extra $158, okay, um, from the stock price. And then if you want to put one on the single-ended output stage too, that's going to be another $79, okay, on top of that. The wooden cases come in several different options that have different prices ranging from about $50 $200. I'm going from memory there. It could be plus or minus 10 bucks on either side of that. But the point is 
there are several options for a uh, wood case style, wood type, color, grain pattern, that kind of thing on there that is going to cost some extra money if you want to go that route. Okay, so depending on what you want to do, you're spending anywhere from about $260 on this thing before shipping and before sales tax to getting close to probably around $700 plus shipping and sales tax and all of that. I bought the this wooden case here, sight unseen. I paid for a cedar case, which they didn't have available at the time that I put the order in way back in March. But when I was asking them about the op amps, they said, hey, we actually have a new wooden case design that we think we're actually going to be able to make quicker and clear out some of this back order stuff that we've got going on a little bit faster. And so they asked if they could replace that new case design or the cedar one that I ordered with this new case design. And then that would also give me the opportunity to uh, introduce it to the world, which I did. So I took them up on that. Here it is. Uh, so I don't know exactly which case. I believe this is Padawak and Zebrawood um, here on this uh, this one. I That may not be right. I will put it down in the description what this is. I don't know the exact price on this, uh, this wood right here as is, but I'm sure the Gishelis will be able to answer that question if you ask them. All right, so that's what you need to know about pricing. And so again, lots of options there. I uh, ordered the Sparkos 3602s and the Amonero USB and the wooden case, and my take home out the door price was just shy of 600 US dollars on all of that. Okay. So, the next thing that we should talk about then is uh, we'll just go ahead and run through uh, the other features. You've pretty much seen them all. Uh, AK4493 ADAC chip, the inputs and outputs, I mean, here we go, if you didn't get a good look at it, here on the front panel, you get one of each flavor of the SPDIF input. Then on the back panel, you get one more of each flavor of the SPDIF input. The Amonero USB module is over here. Then we have the both kinds of outputs. And then a 12 volt DC input over there. The stock power supply is across the room. So let me go get that. I'll show it to you in just a second. All right, here is the stock power supply. It looks dinky, honestly. Like it is not super impressive physically to behold. It is a 12 volt uh, half amp output um, there. And I asked uh, Gino and Sherry about this because uh, this is the, the power supply that Gishelli has been using, at least for their uh, products, their, you know, their lower price products here for quite a while and I've always been impressed with the efficiency of Gino's designs like 12 volts half amp output gives you a grand total of six watts of power to work with coming into the unit and with uh, energy loss due to heat and various other things like you're never really going to get a full six watts going out either but his designs have been really efficient in how they use power and I asked why this is the power supply that they use and the story they told me was that to get FEC compliance is an expensive proposition. You get charged for the compliance testing for every power supply that you want to try. And they tried several. This is the only one that passed. And so since they had one that worked, they just ran with it from uh, that point on, rather than going through the expense of finding additional power supplies to pass the compliance testing. This does open the door and 12 volts is a pretty common uh, connection type to try LPSs. So I have right here a small green computer uh, output or linear power supply that is adjustable from 5 volts to 19 volts. I set it at 12 with a maximum 25 watt output. And so um, I'm also going to report on what that does for the sound when we get there in a bit. Um, I should note that if you're going to use an aftermarket LPS, with um, this or any Gishelli product. It's really kind of a use at your own risk kind of thing. When I asked them, like, what kind of LPSs do you recommend? They said they have to be careful about that, uh, about which ones they can say, uh, because there is risk involved anytime you start using an aftermarket power supply and all that. So I'm not gonna say much more than that, other than I personally had no issues with this, but I do need to drop the disclaimer 
that if you use this or any linear power supply to power the J2S or any other Gishelli product, that it is used at your own risk. If you get one and you plug it in there and you cook it, like that's on you, okay? They may not be able to help you because of uh, warranty voiding and all of that kind of stuff. So just be smart, be careful, make sure that you have a 12 volt connection and it's reliable and reputable and all of that kind of thing. All right, so uh, with that, we'll go ahead and I think cut to the uh, how to of op amp rolling. So uh, yeah, I took a video of me doing that. So let's take a look at that. All right, a quick how to on how to swap the op amps inside the Gishelli J2S. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, and goes fairly quick when you have the right tools. So the thing that you really must have, or you're required to have, are just a little Allen wrench or hex key, whatever you want to call it. This one right here, I believe, is a 3 16th inch, roughly two and a half millimeter if you're on the metric system. So you're gonna need one of these. And then of course you'll need the Gishelli itself and other op amps to put in it. Recommended things to have on hand would be a place to put the op amps that come out of it, something to store the new op amps and a box or something to put the screws that come out of this thing uh, so they don't wander off. I don't even know what box this was. I just grabbed it. What is, what was in here? Oh, my Sonor Ultra Rendu. Okay. Yeah, um, my life is kind of a hell of boxes these days. So anyway, um, the other thing, uh, I use a cleaning cloth for this, just a, a clean microfiber cloth to help you pull the op amps out without stabbing yourself in the fingers because some of them are very sharp, or the pins on them are very sharp. And you're probably also going to want to remove your own fingerprints from the acrylic plate here on the back. So might want to have one of those handy too. All right, how do we do this? All right, so around the outside of the, the perimeter of the back panel here, we see the four Allen screws, which hold the acrylic plate to the, the wooden case. Those have to come out using the Allen key because they are Allen screws. So I'm just gonna pause the video, take those out. I don't think you need to watch that, but these four come out. You can leave these alone. You don't have to touch those just the four on the outside. Okay, I will come back when I get those out. All right, I've got those screws out, and now all you need to do is just gently grab anything you can get your fingers on or tilt this forward, and the PCB board just slides right out, okay? Here's a glamour shot of the PCB if anyone is interested. So what is it we're actually removing here and replacing? It's these three gizmos right here. Those are the op amps or the operational amplifiers. Currently I have in here the TIOP1656s and I'm gonna put in the Sparkos 3602s uh, here in just a moment. All right, um, one other comment here is if you get the wooden case, a thing to note is that the screw holes here are just drilled right into the wood. And screw holes in wood, they, they have a shelf life. Like there's going to be a, a finite number of times that you can take these screws in and out before you start stripping out the, the uh, grooves, you know, because of the, the threads of the screw, okay, before you start stripping those out. So if you know that you are going to be a heavy op amp roller, you either need to have a plan for how to manage that. Like you could probably put some epoxy down there. Um, if they start to wear out, let that epoxy harden and then drive the screw back down in there and it's probably fine. Or just get the aluminum case and then that's probably not an issue because it will likely come with pre-threaded screw holes okay, on there. And then all you have to do is line them up and uh, not get them cross-threaded. So that's just something to keep in mind about the build of the J2S if you're going to do a lot of op amp rolling. You can also see my fingerprints uh, down there. I hope those are on the outside because it would be hard to clean those on the inside without taking that panel out. Eh. All right, not sure how I got my fingers all the way down in there. Honestly, I haven't taken that one out. Okay, a either way, 
they're still in there. Let's get back to the topic at hand here. And that is swapping out the op amps here. Now, the TIs in particular fit pretty snugly in the op amp thoughts, uh, thoughts, <laughs> slots. Okay, and so you kind of have to gently rock them back and forth a little bit before you can just pull them right out. And this is where the cleaning cloth can come in as a multifunction thing, because if you just take the corner of it, put it down here, gently rock this back and forth, and then pull the op amp out. And the reason you may want to do that is because if you just bare finger this, Right here, um, as you rock this out, I've had a couple of times where I would like, as I'm rocking it back and forth to get it out, it would slip. And then somehow this would flip around like this. And one of these pins would stab me right in the finger and it has drawn blood. Okay, so public service announcement here. So just keep that in mind. Now you don't wanna just plop the whole rag down on top of the PCB because there are a lot of little places that could get snagged. So just be careful with that pull gently. Okay, oh, there it goes. That one flipped over, I felt it. And the rag saved me from getting poked again. All right, and then one more. There we go. All right, so we also see here that there's a total of three op amp slots because we have one for each channel on the balanced output line, and then we have one for both channels on the single-ended output uh, line. All right, now, we don't really need the rag, usually, to put these back in. All right, these are the Sparkos op amps here. Come on out. And you can see they are definitely built different than, come on, focus than the TIs are. They, uh, in profile here, looks like something you would shoot in Galaga, honestly, all right? Um, but they just, they have a very different construction, come on, focus, than the TIs do. All right, so then from there, you're just gonna wanna line this up with the slots. So there's a one, a one printed in the corner there. That goes like to the back back left if it's facing this way, back right if it's facing this way, but the other way you can line this up is you see this little notch in the slot right here, okay? Right there in the socket, there is a corresponding notch there on the underside of the op amp. So you just put the notches, you line them up, and then you just poke it right down in there, okay? The Sparkos actually are the looser fitting. The TIs, just fair warning, fit in there quite snugly, and those are the ones that stabbed me because I had to work hard to get them in and out of there. But the Sparkos slide in pretty easy, and they look like that when you get them in there. Okay, so then all that's left to do is to put the PCB back in the case, all right? Line up the front side here. This is the tricky part anyway, because you got to line up the buttons into the cutouts and all of that kind of stuff here, which can take just a little bit of a jangle to get. There it is, got it. And then you put the screws back in and you're off and running. All right, so I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to do some more listening with the Sparkos. All right, I hope this helps you. So it bears repeating that the op amp rolling process here really is not that difficult. It does not require a ton of skill. Again, I will reiterate, do be careful about pulling out particularly those TI op amps because the pins on those things are really sharp, and you can stab yourself in the finger uh, pretty easily, and I definitely learned that the hard way. All right, so... Uh, with that, let's uh, transition into test gear, and then we'll talk about sound and just the various many different options about the sound that we need to discuss. All right, so the test gear that I used for this thing has about, or let's start with the source end first. So 
a lot of the critical listening and acclimation happened by just dropping it into my system quickly, which means that I connected it via SPDIF, the coax SPDIF, to my Singer SU6 uh, DDC, which was in turn connected via USB to a uh, Sonor Ultra Rendu streamer, which I used Rune as a Rune endpoint, listening to lossless or high-res local FLAC files, local DSD files, or streaming uh, lossless or high-res FLAC files from Cobuzz. I also tried the USB input here, plugged directly into my uh, Windows 10 desktop PC. Uh, plugged directly into my Microsoft Surface Pro 4 uh, laptop slash PC, and also plugged directly into that same Sonor Ultra Rendu that I just mentioned. Okay, sourcing all kinds of like high quality audio, same kind of high quality audio files I mentioned just a moment ago. So downstream from there, amps that this thing spent some time plugged into, I would say the most commonly used amp pairing with it was the Lake People G111 Mark II amplifier, which has a MSRP of 599, 599 US dollars, might be 549 right now. And I thought that that was a realistically priced amplifier pairing to do a lot of testing with. But I also tried this a little bit plugged into my Vioelectric HPA V281 amp and the uh, uh, head amp GSX Mini all that via balance connections. And then from the single ended outputs, I tried it a little bit with my KNHA1A Mark II tube amplifier and also the Urzatich Perfidus uh, headphone, headphone amp there. Okay, um, headphones then is a long list. Uh, I have mentioned having the Gishelli J2S in-house for a while and using it as a, a, a reference DAC to use, which should say something. Um, with a lot of headphone reviews that I have done here over the summer. So that list includes, but is not limited to, hi fi HE1000 V2 Stealth Magnet Edition, uh, the Aurorus Borealis, Aurorus Australis, the Kennerton Yallerhorn GH40, and the Meze 109 Pro. Other headphones that I used uh, during the course of this review also were the Hi-Fi Men Susvara, the Hi-Fi Men HE1000SE, the uh, Focal Utopia, the original. I plugged Focal Radiance in a little bit, and I'm pretty sure I tried the Bayer Dynamic DT88600 ohm, and the uh, Masterop Plus Sennheiser HD6XX in there as well. So a wide variety of stuff. Oh, oh and the Hi-Fi Men Aria Stealth, uh, uh, yeah, Aria Stealth Magnet Edition. So a wide variety of things over a wide variety of price points and like performance tiers um, in there. Okay. Um, I did again use the two different power supplies, both the stock and the small green computer, a linear power supply. Um, and I will explain in detail, like which I will let, make sure you know which one I was using when I talk about different aspects of the sound here um, as we go. But I will say that a lot of the critical listening that I did first and foremost was with the stock power supply. So I think a lot of the sonic impressions that I'm going to give are going to be with the stock power supply. And then I will save like what happens when I plug the LPS in uh, for like towards the end of the sound section. So lots of different gear, lots of different configurations. What did I learn? Okay. Let's first tackle whether or not you should consider buying the $50 Amonero USB module. So the J2S in its design is very similar to Gishelli's J2. The J2 had the option of either the AKM4493 DAC chip or an ESS Sabre chip. I'm going to forget the number, but a Sabre chip um, in there. I reviewed the Sabre version back in April of 2022, thought it was excellent. Okay, um, and that DAC also had the same Amonero USB uh, as, uh, module as an option. And what I discovered back then with that DAC was that it, you, you really needed to give that module a very clean signal. 
It's an excellent USB implementation. It can sound great, but it is very sensitive to signal noise. So if you plug the Amonero USB module into a noisy desktop PC, it's gonna be kind of a garbage in, garbage out situation. Okay, uh, and the same is true here of the J2S. So I asked Gino, like what changed with the, uh, the uh, USB implementation, if anything, from the J2 to the J2S, and he said, honestly, not much. He said a couple of things, but they were just tiny little tweaks. And the takeaway here of what I'm getting at is like, it's the same story of USB performance with the J2S as it happened with the J2. And that is if you put in a really noisy USB signal, it's going to have an adverse impact on the sound quality that you get out of this thing. So plugged into my noisy Windows 10 desktop PC directly, there was some harshness and some sharpness that came through in like the upper mids and lower treble that got quite fatiguing. There was just a, a higher noise floor going on and like the spatial accuracy uh, decreased and was not as coherent and all that. There was improvement going from there um, to just a plug and play driver on my Microsoft Surface Pro 4 laptop, which is a little bit cleaner. The, the sonic background dropped a little bit, the spatial integrity uh, improved and tightened up a little bit, everything sounded a little bit cleaner and a little bit more resolving and all of that going to the less noisy computer as a source. Now I should also say that the ASIO driver that you can download and install from Gishelli's website, and I'll put a link down there where you can find that, also really helps. That improves the USB input performance on the J2S um, as it did on the J2. So definitely use that driver on there as well. The biggest uh, in uh, performance improvement, there we go, I gotta get the words out, uh, over USB came when I plugged this directly into the USB output of my Sonor Ultra Rendu streamer. Now that's basically a thousand dollar streamer that has only a USB output and it's a really high quality USB output on that. But boy, did this thing really spring to life with the quietest sonic background yet. Okay. Um, a lot of bass impact came out, like just a lot of improvement in the dynamics and especially in the low end, like kick drums really kicked, okay, when it was plugged directly into the Ultra Rendu. Okay, again, sonic background, the noise floor dropped, the overall clarity and cleanliness improved, the holography of the spatial and presentation tightened up, and the soundstage just got a lot bigger to boot on all of that. So the Ultra Rendu is going to, be uh, a little bit price prohibitive, I would guess, from a lot of the users who are going to buy uh, a product in the price range of the J2S. But um, unfortunately, my Zen stream, my iFi Zen stream was being a little bit difficult and I couldn't get it to switch from the coax output back to the USB without having a big fuss with it. But that also has a really nice, clean, and fairly high quality USB output. And so I suspect it would sound very good on here too. The point that I am making is that, do you need that $50 USB module is gonna depend on the cleanliness of the USB source that you have uh, to put into this because it can sound really, really good with a very clean and clear uh, and quality USB source. It can sound mushy and harsh and just not all that great, frankly, if you don't have a good clean USB source. So that's the first question you need to answer. Do you need a USB for you know, the decoding capabilities on this, which if I didn't mention, it can do PCM up to 384 kilohertz sampling rates and DSD up to DSD 256 or 512, one of those two, okay, on there. So if you need that, then you need to put some thought into the quality of your USB source okay, and, and look there because it does make a big difference for this DAC. Okay. So now let's spend the rest of the review assuming that you have given this DAC a nice clean digital source, whether using the USB or the SPDIF. What kind of sonic performance can you expect? The answer to that 
is good. All right, let's start with the stock TI uh, OPA, uh, OPA, yeah, OPA 1656 um, op amps. You're gonna get, again, a nice, quiet, clean, clear sound with a pretty neutral frequency response, a very good tonal balance throughout the whole frequency range, okay? Um, fairly good resolution and clarity, a not necessarily big or small sound stage, just a sound stage that seems like the size that it needs to be, with reasonably good imaging and separation and holography in there from the balanced output, I should say. The single-ended output is not quite as strong. There is a noticeable drop-off in the, the soundstage narrows a little bit, and some of the clarity and the detail retrieval recede a little bit when going from the balanced to the single-ended output. Um, and that's the most noticeable change beyond the fact that the output levels are different, right? The XLR outputs are louder because they're a four volt output as compared to a two volt output from the single ended. Okay, so uh, in general, I would recommend using this DAC in its balance mode for your primary and critical listening because it does sound better across examples uh, from the balanced output than it does the single-ended output. That is pretty common of DACs in this price range too. So that's not a knock on Gishelli. They're not doing anything wrong. That's just kind of the nature of the beast it goes at the, uh, uh, in this price point there. Um, balanced versus single-ended. All right. Now, so to, to sum up the, the sound using the stock op amps and the stock power supply right here, with the you know with or without the the Amanero USB module, you're talking about like one of the better, if not like you know right up there with the best, uh, you know budget enthusiast balanced DACs out there. Like the sound is accurate, it is satisfying. There is reasonably good detail retrieval and holography to the spatial presentation. The dynamics, which I didn't mention, aren't, aren't standout, but they're not poor either. You just get a really well-rounded, well-balanced performance uh, across the board okay, with, again, stock power supply, stock op amps, an excellent budget enthusiast choice. All right, the 1612s are an interesting uh, little story here. Um... Gishelli is not offering them anymore. They pulled them from the, the market. And uh, the reason, uh, the reason, the stated reason is that they, uh, they, that Gishelli needs the 1612s for some amplifier designs that they have going on. And the 1612s work better for that. I had trouble with both sets of 1612s that they sent me. And so this is also an opportunity to talk about how good uh, Gishelli's customer service is. The, um, what happened is that the first one they sent me, it was like one of their earliest J2S boards. And that one had some issues with the, even the 1656s, but sounded great with the Sparkos. Um, the 1612s had a weird clicking noise in it, some channel imbalance and a lot of white noise background going on. It was unlistenable. Okay. Um, and so I reached out to the Gishelli's and said, what's going on with this? And they were a bit baffled by the problem too. So they sent me a new board, no hassle, and two new sets of op amps, both the 1656 and the 1612. So great customer service there. It was not difficult at all. They didn't fight me. They just stepped up and took care of it. Okay, no problem. Uh, the, the 1612s though, even the second set on the new board uh, didn't that like did, didn't improve. There was still a lot of white noise in the background, like just very loud staticky kind of white noise, just unlistenable in any real meaningful way. So, which is odd because the Gishelli's, they say they test everything before they send it out and it worked at their location. But by the time that got to me, something was wrong with the 1612s. But that's kind of a moot point at this point because they have pulled them from the website. And so that's no longer an issue. So the rest of the review here, we're, you know, we'll get to the, uh, the Sparkos op amps here in just a second. Um, okay, uh, and those worked great on both boards. So anyway, I just, uh, I want to uh, 
throw that out there. If you wonder where the 1612s went and why I haven't reported more on them, okay, now you know why. And again, thanks to Gino and Sherry for just stepping up and sending a replacement board and replacement 1656 op amps, and then everything worked great with those things um, from there on in. So let's jump into talking about the, the uh, Sparkos op amps. All right. Where we really need to spend more time and where the J2S gets really exciting though is with those Sparkos 3602 op amps because that's where it really opens up and where um, this can become a really compelling value. So what changes with the Sparkos op amps? Well, everything gets better, right? The performance across the board really improves over the stock TI op amps. The soundstage does get impressively bigger, but also more holographic, right? And uh, so there's just much better instrument placement and then like separation between sonic images. The resolution takes a big jump forward as well. Just a lot of subtle details are pulled out and resolved much more comfortably and clearly with the Sparkos op amps than the, the TIs, okay? The timbre really improves. There becomes a really rich, natural timbre to the sound. The frequency response and the tonality are still really good across the board, right? Uh, so that uh, stays, like, at least doesn't get any worse. Like it's still really well tonally balanced and all of that. Though I think the bass gets more authoritative. It reaches a little bit deeper. It might rumble just a little bit more and it is more impactful. Like the dynamics come forward more on with the Sparkos op amps than they do the TIs, right? So you just overall get more definition, more refinement, more detail, bigger and more holographic soundstage, more lush and more natural timbre. I mean, what else do you want? The, Spark the Sparkos 3602s just vastly improve the performance of this DAC across the board, okay? How so? Well, I kid you not, that from the balanced output at least, the performance of this jumps right up into the thick of it with Bifrost 2 slash 64. Okay, uh, Aries 12th anniversary edition, Socrus DAC 1421, or is it 1431 now? It's one of those two. Okay, uh, the uh, just right up there with, with those right on that performance tier, which to me, those three have kind of separated themselves from the rest of the pack in that like $700 to $1,000 price point. And this gets right up there with them, okay, on that. Um, so really good improvement there. And I'll do a little bit more detailed comparison with the Bifrost 2 slash 64 here in a moment. Now, that's with the stock power supply. You can improve the sound here even more again by using an aftermarket linear power supply. And I will put a link to a 12, a newer 12 volt version of the small green, small green computer LPS in the description down below. Okay, when I plugged this in, what happened is that, that base, the base dynamics, the physicality of the base was like the first thing that sprang forward. There was just a, a more thump there was more impact to the sound. There was a more bass extension and rumble. It just, it took on this like weightier, fuller uh, characteristic down in the bass. Didn't really elevate the frequency response to it so much as it just like the, the cleanliness and the quickness and just the, the, the physicality of it draws the ear down there a little bit more. And it was just a more engaging and fun sound while still maintaining accuracy nor being over the top to my ear. The dynamics across the whole board improve, like uh, snare drums get snappier and like that sort of thing. The sonic background lowered yet again and like the, the holography of the spatial presentation tightened up yet a little bit more. Like it was a noticeable improvement moving to the LPS. Like was it night and day a completely revelatory? No, not quite. But was it a, a really solid and noticeable upgrade? Yes, it was. So what happens there is like with the stock power supply, 
this thing, the, the, the J2S and the Sparkos op amps might be like kind of like right in the thick of it or maybe just behind those other DACs that I just mentioned. You put the linear power supply on it and it just straight up trades blows. Like it becomes uh, like just right there, like just as good with a lot of them there um, in, in some ways. All right, so does an LPS help? Yes, it does. Um, this particular one wasn't just like, oh, completely re revelatory, but it did offer some small and important and noticeable improvements that, again, elevated the performance of this and made it possibly an even more compelling value uh, in the market than it is already. All right, let's do that comparison with the Bifrost 2 slash 6.4. All right, features wise here, uh, the Bifrost 2 only decodes PCM files and at that only up to 24 bit, 192 kilohertz sampling rates, which is what the Gishelli will top out at from the SPDIF inputs. But if you need, if you have a quality USB output and you like DSD and all of that, then the Gishelli wins on decoding options via USB. The Gishelli also has more inputs than the Bifrost 2 does, though they have the same complement of input options. They both do USB and then SPDIF in two flavors of RCA coaxial and Toslink fiber optic. It's just that the Gishelli has two each of those, whereas the, the uh, Bifrost has one each of those. Um, the other thing that I will say here is that the gap in performance between balanced output and single-ended output is noticeably smaller for the Bifrost than it is for the Gishelli J2S. So if you are in a position where you want to use the balanced and single outputs simultaneously, like say balanced output to your headphone amp for critical listening and then single-ended output to uh, desktop speakers or whatever um, from there, then the 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 performance gap for the Bifrost 2 between those two is smaller. It is there, it is detectable, but the gap is bigger for the J2S. So keep that in mind if that matters. But for the rest of the comparison, let's do balanced output versus balanced output. And for this comparison, I um, ran this through my, both of these, through the Lake People G111 Mark II, and then used a couple of different headphones um, among them being the Hi Fi Men Aria. I think I got the Utopia out for this, as well as the, the HE1000 SEV2 Stealth Magnet Edition, okay, um, and so forth, uh, to do this comparison in there. And what I found was really interesting. The Bifrost 2, and then again, this is the slash 64 iteration of it, has a little bit more lower mid range presence to it. I don't want to call it warmth because it doesn't really strike me as being warm, but there is just a little bit more presence and fullness through there, which has uh, an impact on timbre a little bit. So depending on what instruments were playing and like what kind of voices were going on, I thought it was a bit of a split as to which one had better timbre uh, because of that. I think the J2S is a little bit um, more closer to true neutral through its frequency response. The Bifrost 2 is also a little bit more recording quality sensitive. There was a region in the upper, uh, upper mid-range lower treble where like crash cymbals and all that could be a little bit forward and harsh on the Bifrost 2. Not bad, okay? um, but it could be a little bit fatiguing going on there with some recordings where the J2S was a little bit more forgiving. The Bifrost 2 is also like consistently a little bit more dynamic and impactful and like active and energetic in its sound, whereas the J2S was slightly more laid back. Not a huge difference, but noticeable. Okay, uh, they both had nice big wide sound stage. I think the Bifrost 2 may have been just a hair better at depth, okay, but not by a lot. 
Okay, and then like their resolution, like I have to call it a dead heat in terms of like what they are actually able to resolve and pull out in terms of a detail retrieval thing was about dead even. Some people might say that the Bifrost 2 slash 6.4 is a little bit more resolving, but I think that's because of a lot of which like happens in that mid-range forwardness that I mentioned in comparison here, where things like room reverbs and the zizzy sound of bows being dragged across string, strings and all that is emphasized just a little bit more than the J2S does because of that slightly you know emphasized mid-range range right there. Okay. But my takeaway here is that in terms of like, you know, by the time you fully load this thing up, Sparkos op amps, using the LPS and all of that, which one was better? No, they are a little bit different, but I will put it this way. To my ear, the Bifrost 2 slash 6.4 had the higher overall performance ceiling, but also the lower overall performance floor. You put a bad recording through the Bifrost 2 slash 6.4 and it could get, you know, harsh and fatiguing, lose some of its spatial coherence and, and that sort of thing. Put a really good recording through these and the Bifrost 2 slash 6.4, why is that so hard to say? Feels like I'm slurring it all as I go. But anyway, the Bifrost, it is a little bit clearer and has a little bit more clarity and maybe just like sounds a little bit more natural, I think, with really good recording. So it has a slightly higher performance ceiling. It can be a little bit more refined and defined than the J2S with a little bit more active and energetic sound if you like that kind of thing. The J2S is more forgiving of bad recordings and thus less fatiguing Though it doesn't reach quite as high as the Bifrost can if you put a little, uh, put very good recordings through it. Again, it is a tiny gap in both directions, right? Like both of them will let you know if you're hearing a bad recording. Both of them will let you know if you're hearing a good recording. It's just that the, the Bifrost 2 is a little bit more reactive to those differences than the J2S is for both for better and for worse. Okay. So that is my comparison there. And again, for more detailed comparisons with other DACs and like with more explanation as to where this fits into the DAC market, um, see my upcoming video, save for this, which I'm about to drop here. And that is the Gishelli J2S here can be an astounding value. Here's why I say that. Let's say that you know you only need the Sparkos op amps on the balanced output. You're just going to use the balanced output. You don't need the single ended. Okay. Save $79 right there by just putting a stock TI op amp on the single ended output line and not buying a third Sparkos op amp. Okay. Use the aluminum case instead of a wood case. Maybe you get the Amonero USB module. Maybe you don't, but with the aluminum case, and the upgrade to the Sparkos op amps on just the balanced output, you're looking at about $420-ish, if I, my math is right on that, okay? And I looked at the website correctly there, uh, for the J2S with those Sparkos op amps on the output line, no USB. Add the Almonero USB module, and you're getting close to $470 US dollars. Add one of these small green computer, um, uh, LPS is, and that's like another 190 bucks. Okay. So, you know, close to two on that, 200 on top of that 670, all that. But even if you just use the stock power supply on this, you're getting a whole lot of DAC for the money there. You're getting a DAC that competes up there in the 700 to a thousand dollar price range for under 500 bucks. Okay. Again, add one of these and you're getting a DAC that competes even more and even better with that $700 to $1,000 uh, price range here for under $700, okay, if you want. So can be a really compelling value there and something to consider. So like who is the J2S for? Who should consider buying this? So again, you do need to be careful and really out wrestle with the question of, do you need the USB input? Because the USB input can be amazing and it does give you DSD and higher sampling rates of PCM if you wanna use HQ player or something like that, okay? 
but it comes with the fact that it does not reject noise particularly well, and so you need to be careful about the quality of the USB source that you are plugging into it. So that's the first thing you need to worry about. But if you are an audiophile on a budget, you can buy the stock version of the J2S with the op amps for you know right around $300 or so. Okay, it's going to be a little, like, if you do the $260 version, it's going to be close to $300 by the time you, you factor in sales tax and shipping and that sort of thing. Okay, uh, close to $350 if you put the uh, Amonero USB module in it, but that's still kind of like in the budget enthusiast tier, I would call it. And you're going to get very good performance at that price with a clear upgrade path in the same unit. You can come back later and add the Sparkos 3602s that Gishelli offers or any other uh, op amps out there that fit the socket type on this one and get a significant bump in performance, okay? So that's who should consider this. Or if you are in the market for a mid-fi DAC, in like you're looking in that $700 to $1,000 tier, you're looking at Bifrost 2, you're looking at Aries 12th Anniversary Edition, all of that, Consider this one. Consider it with the Sparkos op amps upgrading the power supply. It's going to be right there with those um, in there. And uh, you get the, you know, the joy of supporting a company like Gishelli because they run a pretty cool little company, uh, in my opinion. All right. So that's who I think should consider the J2S. So we'll sum all of this up because we have been here for a while. The Gishelli J2S. Excellent. Okay. In stock configuration, one of the best $300 DACs out there with the Sparkos 3602 op amps, okay, with or without an upgraded power supply, can punch up, gets into that next performance tier that is currently um, occupied by Bifrost 2, by Denifrips Aries, okay, like up in that, that range, which is impressive just from op amp rolling, okay, that's really impressive that it gets up there, right? The op amp rolling is easy, right? So don't let that scare you away. If you are scared of that, you still want the Sparkos, Gishelli will send it to you, the Sparkos to you pre-installed. Okay. Really good, okay? I, I can't sing the praises enough. The only real drawback, if you will, is that the single-ended uh, uh, output is really just not quite up there with the, the balanced output, so that's one thing to consider. And the other is that the USB module, while it can sound great, is sensitive to noise. So you need to have a good, clean USB source if you're going to consider the USB module, okay? But that's about it. Otherwise, really well done. I really like this. I'm glad that I get to keep it. I will find a use for it in my various systems around. I'm sure that you will hear it mentioned in further, uh, in future reviews as one of the DACs that I use to evaluate some other piece of gear. All right. So thanks to Gino and Sherry for being such a pleasure to work with and offering me the opportunity to reveal this new wooden case design to try the different op amps. So, thanks for watching my review of the Gishelli J2S. Uh, please remember to like, subscribe, uh, leave a comment, check out my PayPal, my Patreon, and all of those things. And if you're interested in buying the J2S, please consider using my affiliate link in the description below. So again, thanks for watching, and as always, enjoy the music.